Creation Club. The very mention of this wanton cash grab tends to evoke strong emotions from many, which oddly enough leads many others to defend this institution just as vocally, for some reason. Needless to say, Bethesda's grand plan to get its customers to purchase mini DLCs is steeped in controversy and hard feelings. However, for many of us that are usually more than happy to grab CC content as it goes on sale for free, the question remains of whether the remaining content we don't yet own is actually worth buying. That's why we at Grey Gaming decided to purchase every piece of CC content and give our honest opinion on whether it's actually worth spending real world dollars in order to purchase the imaginary Bethesda bucks required to buy mods, I mean mini DLC. Today in part one of a three part series we will be looking at all weapons and some of the bundled armor that can be acquired through the Creation Club store. Before we begin, let's address the two headed elephant in the room and head off those snippy little comments before they happen. First of all, not all CC content is available year-round. Bethesda often releases holiday-specific content, which is then pulled from the store when it's no longer culturally relevant. They also tend to pull poorly performing content or cycle them through every once in a while. As such, there may be some items missing, which you may later find available on the store. That doesn't give you license to come back to the comment section four years from now because there's now an item we never covered. You know who you are, and you should be ashamed. For this series, we purchased everything that was available as of March 31st, 2023. We pinky promise, all $120 worth. Second, we will not be covering the skins content. I know, bummer. How else are you supposed to know whether the red pit boy paint job is worth the same as the blue one? Yeah, skins are completely subjective and go on sale for free every single month. Eventually, if you're patient enough, you can get it all for free anyway, so we're not really going to worry so much about that. Also, the various breeds of doggos, we're treating them as skins too. Moving on, we will be comparing some bundled items together, so some armor may turn up on the weapons list, some weapons in the armor list, it all depends on how long these videos become. Something tells me, long. So this brings us to how we're going to be ranking each of these items. We'll be using a point system, from 0 on the very bad end to 5 on the good end. Weapons will be ranked on 5 key categories, ammunition capacity, ammunition availability, weapon damage, quest acquisition, and lore friendliness. For the first three, we'll be attempting to compare them to weapons already found in-game. To receive points in these three categories, they must be at least comparable to something that we already have in-game. Weapons that don't use ammo sort of get the first two points as a gimme. Items that are earned through the completion of a quest earn one point. I mean, if we have to shell out Bethesda rubles for it, we might as well get a little extra gameplay out of it. Finally, items which do not conflict directly with existing lore will also receive one point. So for example, a melee weapon, two points, that does less damage than an equivalent we already have in vanilla, zero points, is just sitting in a box somewhere, zero points, but is lore friendly, one point. It would receive a three out of five ranking. Armor will be ranked similarly. Instead of damage, we'll be ranking against damage protection. Instead of ammunition availability, we'll be measuring based off of its weight compared to other similar armors. To make things a little bit easier on ourselves, we will be sticking to either standard, sturdy, or heavy combat armor groups. Likewise, power armor will be ranked under similar principles, only comparing it to in-game versions of the power armor that we already have. All right, now onto the mods. I mean, paid mods. I mean, mini DLC. You remember how we said we wouldn't be covering skins content in this video? Holy Adam, were we wrong about that. If you're looking for a reason to hate the Creation Club, look no further than the Handmade Shotgun. It is a shameless reskin of the Double Barrel Shotgun. It does the exact same amount of damage, has the exact same set of modifications available, it's a skin, and kind of a stupid one if you have even the slightest idea of how recoil works. If you were worried about having to slog through a tough quest line only to get stuck with this as a reward, well don't you worry your pretty little head off, it appears in your inventory as soon as you install. Also, this thing is really badly coded. I was encountering this thing so often on the bodies of dead NPCs that I actually felt the need to remove it from my game files, which thankfully is an option for PC. Alter your game files at your own risk. Console users, unfortunately, are stuck with it once you've installed. Using our objective ranking system, I mean it does have the ammo capacity and damage as the existing double barrel shotgun, so I guess it earns two points for that. It uses the standard shot shells so I suppose it gets a point for that, and even though it's sort of a logic-breaking item, it isn't necessarily lore-breaking, so I guess it gets a point for that as well. So objectively speaking, 4 out of 5 ain't bad, but I personally wouldn't spend my Bethesda yen on it.
The Tunnel Snakes add-on is pretty much the opposite end of the spectrum from the handmade shotgun. You get a pretty engaging, if short, questline whereby you get to follow in the footsteps of everyone's third favorite Tunnel Snake. I'll avoid any further spoilers, but at the end of it, you end up with three stacks of new items. The first is a Tunnel Snakes outfit, which is pretty comparable to what we see in Fallout 3. It's just a vault suit with a greaser jacket bearing a snake across the back. It's not what I would necessarily consider armor, it's more in the domain of clothing. It only offers two defense, but does offer a rare 30 resistance to poisoning, so it has that going for it. There is also the classic 10mm pistol, which looks more like those found in earlier Fallout games, and while these are once again sort of logic bending, I have to say they look cool as heck. Last up is a unique version of the classic 10mm pistol, and it's a doozy. It's completely covered in custom engraving, and is basically the pistol equivalent to the radium rifle, somehow adding 50 radiation damage to the existing ballistic damage, without the need of a focusing dish like the radium rifle does. The pistol is pretty much equivalent to the vanilla 10mm, but does considerably more damage. Not so much that it's game-breaking, but still a considerable step up from the vanilla version, so you get some actual gameplay benefit out of this add-on. So if you're keeping score at home, it receives a point for ammo capacity, damage, ammo availability, adds a quest, and is lore-friendly, so I believe that gives us an objective 5 out of 5. Everyone remembers the pint-sized slasher. Okay, I don't because I'm a good person, in Fallout games anyway, but just in case you're in the mood to dress up as a creepy child clown and perpetrate more stabbing than a Brazzers flick, then this one's for you. Upon embarking on a fetch quest which is just convoluted enough that ends just before you get sick of it, you find him, the pint-sized slasher. After dealing with an actually pretty well choreographed boss fight, you get the things you dropped hard-purchased fake money on, and... Eh, meh. The knife isn't terrible, but there isn't really an equivalent in-game. The Disciple's Blade is probably the closest equivalent, and they're close enough from base to fully upgraded that I don't see a reason to subtract a point for damage. The costume, on the other hand, does provide enough protection that I would consider it armor, and in that regard, it's pretty terrible, offering relatively light defense. However, it does come with a pretty nice speed buff of plus 15% red speed, so it does get 4 out of 5, and the knife gets a perfect score. While it certainly doesn't match my playstyle, I will concede that there are definite pros for survival players or melee builds. I'm not gonna lie, I had high hopes for this one. It actually was one I picked up for free during a giveaway month and was super excited to get to finally wreak havoc with the bad boy that I ruled Fallout 3 in New Vegas with, only to discover the unfortunate truth. It's the handmade shotgun that tried just a tiny bit harder. It does have a quest, technically. Are you ready? Go find a gunner who's been added to the rooftop of the GNR building and kill them. They have the PGR. Quest over. I'm still docking the point. It's my ranking, I can do what I want. The weapon is sadly just a reskinned laser musket, with fewer upgrade choices and uses the much harder to find 2mm EC ammo. I at least acknowledge that the writer for this tried harder than the handmade rifle, but it still falls short in almost every category. Damage is way below the in-game gauze rifle, and with single shot capacity is way lower as well. The ammunition availability isn't as bad as it could be, but one of the worst in the base game, and calling the path to getting this weapon a quest is rather charitable. It's a standing out in the middle of the commonwealth. At least it doesn't break any long-standing lore, so it does have that going for it, and I absolutely love the in-game model for these. I mean, they just look cool as heck. I can't add it to my objective ranking system, but I did want to at least point that out. One out of five is pretty poor, but the price tag is also low enough that it does occasionally go for sale on free, which is how I got it in the first place, so this is actually one thing I didn't have to purchase for this review. This weapon isn't the juggernaut that it was in New Vegas, but I can forgive that. The writer worked hard on this and you can tell, the model isn't just a reskinned vanilla weapon, it's a completely new design, and the modifications available are plenty and each changes the weapon's aesthetics as well as its utility. Fully maxed out, it's pretty comparable to the in-game sniper rifle, just a little bit lower on the damage output, and just like its vanilla equivalent, it can be converted to the ubiquitous 38 round in exchange for a significant decrease in damage. The quest to earn 
apartment is, well, it starts out kind of spooky. It actually pulled me right in and then it just sort of eh, fails to deliver. I thought that there would be a final showdown sort of like there was with the pint sized slasher, but nope, just a creepy note you read in the quest ends. All that aside, I did pick this up for free. So once again, it's not like I can get mad about it. All in all, the good damage, comparable ammo availability, modifications paired with the quest that at least tried and the fact that it doesn't break any lore and this gets a perfect five out of five. It's even better if you're able to get it for free like I was able to do a while back before starting this project. I'm going to go ahead and review the id software bundle as one single item, mostly because the sentiments are pretty much the same for all. It's pretty much underwhelming in every way. The armor just pops into your inventory as soon as you launch, so I suppose it's helpful for survival runs. It provides the greatest gameplay value of the bunch as it is upgradable to Mark IV and is quite superior to the in-game combat armor equivalents at every step, and the fact that it's always just 20 pounds, it's going to be your best friend as far as keeping a low weight to high protection ratio, and it provides ballistic energy and radiation protection. I would probably qualify this as borderline game breaking. Objectively, it's a three out of five, but it's a bit too overpowered for my liking. The Quake Thunderbolt requires a bit more work. You have to travel to a specific location and undergo a boss fight. The Thunderbolt itself is sort of an amalgamation of the laser rifle, the flamer, and the Tesla rifle. Most of the modifications follow the naming and basic improvement principles of the laser rifle, but the weapon handles and looks more like a Tesla rifle and fires like a flamer. There's not a good in-game equivalent, but compared to a laser rifle which both fire fusion cells, it does superior damage to the laser rifle. Objectively, it's a 4 out of 5. Last is the BFG 9000, and man, I might have a new favorite punching bag for this series. Without any spoilers, you have to go to a very dangerous place for it. It is so rough that you might be forgiven for thinking that this is going to be a game-changing powerhouse, but the BFG is just a big effing gun. It's not a powerful gun. Dealing 50 ballistic damage and 250 energy damage damage, but with a weapon that does so much splash damage that you can easily get caught in the blast yourself, it's more of a liability than an asset. It also uses a special proprietary ammunition round, and while it does start popping into containers here and there, it's still hard to find and adds yet another type of ammo that you have to pack around with you. Considering that the right perks can make the vanilla gauze rifle, which can be acquired more easily, pass 600 damage without the self-fragging tendencies, and the BFG is probably the least useful weapon we've covered so far objective one out of five. Overall, the id software bundle is really hit or miss, but I would say they're more miss than hit. With the BFG underperforming, the Doom Classic Armor's game-breaking overperformance, and the Quake Thunderbolt really being a gameplay sweet spot but lacking any reload animations, and overall, I would rate the bundle as a whole as two out of five, easily something you could do without. I plan on removing it from my game files as soon as this review is over. The Zayton Arsenal provides us with three weapons we could interact with and use in the Fallout 3 DLC Mothership Theta. It adds the Alien Shock Baton, the Atomizer, which is a two-barreled handgun, and the Disintegrator Rifle. They're acquired through a short quest, it doesn't overstay its welcome, and it at least tries. The weapons aren't anything earth-shattering, pretty comparable to their vanilla equivalents which are plasma weapons and shock batons. But what I thought was really neat was that many of the modifications for the Alien Blaster Pistol are available for the Disintegrator and Atomizer, like the ability to convert from alien blaster ammo to plasma cartridges. Furthermore, many of these modifications alter the weapon's models, so they took models from an older game, faithfully recreated them, but then gave you completely new looks if you chose to modify them. They also added a respectable amount of alien blaster ammo without flooding the game in them, despite the fact that I find little use for these as I don't tend to do melee builds and I hate weapons with slow projectiles like plasma weapons and the like. I might keep these in my in-game files just to be able to add them as wall hangers to my collection room. All things considered, these get an objective 5 out of 5. This is another one where I actually had a pretty good time. The story was somewhat believable by Fallout 4 standards and the two Manuel rifles you get, both of which have unique buffs and slightly different models and modifications, are quite neat to look at. They really look like a rifle from the late 1800s but in a semi-auto 308 that puts pretty much every other non-DLC ballistic weapon to shame. The drum magazine is a little absurd and the rifles might be a little overpowered considering you could grab these at very low levels, but some of the more powerful mods are locked behind perks, so it's not 
not as game-breaking as some others on this list. Both the rifle and carbine are slightly different, have slightly different mods, and have different stats, but I think I'm safe by ranking them together with a full 5 out of 5. I wholeheartedly enjoy these, and they fit my playstyle pretty well, so I won't be purging these like I have with some other items on this list. This is probably the most well-rounded CC weapon add-on I've used yet. Next up, let's talk about the CR-74L. I started out loving this gun. It looks cool as 3-Dog enjoying a glass of Deezer's lemonade, but it's sort of a paper tiger. The add-on includes two quests. One tracks the footsteps of the rifle's former owner, and at first it sounds like a heartwarming story of love conquering all, but it overstays its welcome and in the end really doesn't provide a reward for completing it. The second quest offers access to a number of additional mods, which can make the CR-74L more useful, but even when fully upgraded, the damage output is comparable to the standard in-game combat rifle after it's been downgraded to use 38 ammo, which is to say, it's not all that useful, either in 45 or 556 variants. This is one of the cases where less is more. The quests overstayed their welcome, and both questlines which amount to fetch quests delivered via terminal entries could have easily been combined. I know they were trying to give you more gameplay for your money, but there just wasn't enough substance to justify the 45 minutes I spent tracking down mods for a wall hanger. So the Tesla Cannon, one of my favorite weapons from Fallout 3. I pwned many an NPC with that thing. I was skeptical with this one, but hopeful. You start out by tracking down some gunners in a tough place to be. You get some meta references thrown in your face along the way. You partake in a boss fight and well, you, you get it, you pick it up. It looks cool. The various modifications make it look more or less like different unique versions available in Fallout 3 and New Vegas. And the mods come with a trade-off, you know, those things RPGs normally do to make sure your character doesn't become too OP. It's great for character balancing, not so great for a weapon you try to incorporate into your pay-to-win business model. Given the difficulty of obtaining it, the weapon stats leave a lot to be desired and you can't aim it, so those long-distance one-shots that fans were expecting, yeah, that's not happening. There really isn't an in-game equivalent, but even just comparing it to the vanilla laser weapon, you can get a lot more damage and much more effective of a long-range energy weapon sniper. I wish I I could say I was surprised, but at this point I, I'm not. It pretty much just gets 2 out of 5 because it does have an honest to goodness quest associated with it and it's quite lore friendly. I'll be pretty brief with this one, it sorta sucks. Not because of its damage, it's actually pretty decent, it's just the fact that it lobs its projectiles in an arc and makes it pretty pointless to try and aim with. It's sort of a running gun type weapon and that just didn't suit my playstyle. The quest to get it isn't terrible, and even adds a free power armor frame where there normally isn't one. It is just equipped with raider pieces, but hey, free frame and that will come in handy later when we're talking about power armor. For this one, I'll be nice and I'll give it 5 out of 5, though arguments could be made for as low as 3 out of 5 depending on what you choose to compare it to in base game. Hey, it's not a perfect ranking system. What can I say about the Solar Cannon? It's a gun that shoots sunlight. It actually looks pretty cool in action. It's sort of like the dubstep gun from Saints Row though. Cool for a few seconds, but then it wears out its welcome. The quest to find it has two options. Bypass options based on the perks you've selected in case you're in too much of a hurry or don't care about the story, or the clue-driven scavenger hunt option for those detail-oriented players, which is a nice touch for the writer. The ending is actually a bit funny, a bit sad, and a bit unexpected, if for no other reason than the fact that the rest of the CC quests have been so cut and dried that I've been conditioned not to look for alternatives, so it was nice to get snapped out of that funk. The gun itself has a decent ammo capacity and shoots FCs, so it's quite plentiful and doesn't do a huge amount of damage, but it's respectable. The main drawback is much like the Zayton arsenal, the projectiles are slow moving. Not quite as bad as the plasma or Zayton weapons, but just slow enough that the feral ghouls I was testing it on could dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge their way around my shots nearly 50% of the time. That minor dislike out of the way, I haven't been able to find any reference to the Solar Cannon in previous Fallout games, but I haven't been able to find any references outside of the Fallout universe either, so we'll tentatively give it the point for being lore friendly. I'll be nice to it and give it 5 out of 5.
So I'm going to be brief on this one since I'll be covering the penthouse itself and workshop components in a different video, but the add-on also includes a unique weapon and outfit. Neither of these are all that special. The outfit is just Nick Valentine's raincoat in a slightly different color, and the handgun is just a 44 Magnum that does slightly more damage than the in-game equivalent sporting a black paint job. I mean, neither of these are worse than the in-game counterparts. Actually, the raincoat actually offers a considerable increase in ballistic and energy resistance. They just really aren't that unique. I'm sure most people who buy this pack aren't doing so for the quest line or weapons, but objectively, I didn't hate the quest line, although I did have to Google how to start it because it didn't trigger properly. And both the weapon and armor are improvements over their original, so 5 out of 5, I guess. Much like the Noir Penthouse, Shroud Manor also adds some costumes and weapons, both of which are just new colors slapped onto pre-existing outfits. There is the Silver Dress, which is just a silver version of the Red Sequin Dress worn by characters like Magnolia. There's the Shroud Outfit, which is just the Silver Shroud Outfit with a red scarf this time, and there's a new weapon, the Silver Sidearm, which is the Deliverer with a fancier paint job. It has the exact same mods available, does the exact same damage, and appears to have the same fire speed, so for players who didn't want to sully themselves by joining the railroad, this is a fairly decent alternative. However, it does not have the Deliverer's unique weapon effect, so it is just a fancy imitation of the real deal. All in all, I'll rank these together as 4 out of 5, could be better, but could be a lot worse. I actually enjoyed my time exploring this add-on. There's not a lot to it. It's just an engaging, short dungeon dive where you get to explore an old television theater and get a little bit of backstory onto the events leading up to October 23rd, 2077. You know, normal stuff you expect to find in a Fallout game. The Cosmic Cannon is actually a pretty decent concept. It starts out life as a cryolator, but instead of using the uber rare cryo ammo, it actually uses regular fusion cells, so no more of the drawbacks of using the cryolator in a fun 1950s space toy package. Of course, for those who prefer longer range engagements, there's a mod to make it more like a standard laser rifle, and while laser rifles deal much better damage output, the weapon still packs enough punch to be effective in the hands of a skilled player, who plays almost exclusively on casual difficulty. I had fun using it at least. Compared to the Cryolator, it is more versatile, and both cryo and laser versions deal better damage, so I'll give it the point. And that, I believe, rates it at 5 out of 5. There is also an outfit and a set of power armor, but but I think I will rate those separately in my armor and power armor video. And that, dear viewer, is every new weapon that you can get through the Creation Club. If you found this video helpful, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. If you're still watching, a like would be appreciated. Until next time, stay safe, and we hope to see you all here later on Grey Gaming.